Uh, good evening. <laughs> um, could, could you summarize your testimony? Because we are getting late. And then I'm sure we have a number of questions asked, if it's okay with you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Council President Clark, members of City Council. Uh, here on my right is, uh, I'm Liz Hirsch, Director of the Office of Homeless Services. Uh, this is Tara Gaudin, uh, Chief of Staff, and Rodney Cherry, Director of Finance. Uh, I'm here today to testify on behalf of our request for $94,728,265,000 in grant and general fund appropriations for FY18 to support our mission of making homelessness rare, brief, and non-recurring. Uh, let me just briefly say that um, over the past year, uh, using the funds that the, the very precious tax dollars, we were able to prevent homelessness for about 800 households out of nearly 6,000 requests. We're hoping to expand prevention over the coming year and to help more people remain stably housed without, when they're faced with a housing crisis without coming into emergency housing, unless it's absolutely the course of last resort. In terms of making homelessness brief, uh, our goal is to continue to expand rapid rehousing, which is a short-term subsidy accompanied by housing case management and uh, income stabilization. Over the past year, we served over 300 households and again are hoping to expand this number in the coming year. And in fact, our budget request includes $525,000 to expand rapid rehousing. And we were successful in getting funds from the Pennsylvania Housing Affordability and Re Reinvestment, I'm sorry, um, the FAIR program to increase rapid rehousing. And finally, over the past year, we were able to move about 800 individual households, individuals, and families into permanent supportive housing. This is an evidence-based practice with a, an average 90% success rate. And we've and we included in our budget request an additional $500,000 to expand permanent supportive housing. I'd just like to briefly highlight a few items that um, are of particular interest to Council. Uh, last year, we were able, thanks to your help, we were able to expand our funding and services for young people, young adults, ages 20, 18 to 24, experiencing homelessness, and to add 25 emergency beds, 25 rapid beds, um, counseling for LGBTQ youth, and employment services for 75 youth and 24-hour access to services. In the Fairhill area, the so-called Gurney Street, uh, we've invested several hundred thousand dollars over the past year to try and help those on the uh, corridor who are ready to come in get housing and emergency services. Over the winter, we provide respite housing for 46 people, and there are about 33 who have either gotten or are in the pipeline to get housing first through Pathways to Housing. We've also helped several get, get um, treatment that they need. Uh, we've expanded our services in domestic violence, Thanks to the support of council, um, are now offering 200 emergency housing beds through Women Against Abuse, have quadrupled transitional housing, and are providing training through the safety network. Uh, the concourse was a very significant hotspot over the winter. Uh, we are looking now to expand daytime services. We've expanded the, daytime, the new life center to seven days a week, seven to seven, and are working in partnership with SEPTA to expand uh, the Hub of Hope, which is run by Project Home. We are very pleased over the winter that we made it through our second winter in a row without anybody dying on the streets of exposure by adding, uh, yes, ah, we wish it could be year round, um, but we were able to um, keep, keep people safe. Um, we are focusing quite a bit on shelter safety. We understand from our discussions with people who are on the street and experiencing street homelessness that they often don't want to come into our emergency housing. 
Uh, so we are putting a laser focus on our shelter system to assess how we can make it um, as safe as possible. We've taken a number step of steps and how we can reduce any possible barriers to people coming in. One thing that we've piloted through the DNC and through the winter are respites, very small programs that where they, people can come in directly with outreach rather than having to wait and through the intake process. And we have seen higher rates of people coming in and ultimately getting housing. So we're looking to expand the respite model of smaller programs as well. And finally, while we're thrilled that the Congress seems to have come to a budget agreement, which will mean no cuts in homeless services, we are being vigilant. Um, one little known fact is that the Affordable Care Act created parity between a, uh, behavioral health and physical health. This expansion of Medicaid in Pennsylvania and this provision is enabling us to provide supportive services to people in rent subsidized units, so called supportive housing. Um, if we were to lose any of the HUD funding that we currently get, or if we were to lose these provisions from the Affordable Care Act, it would significantly undermine our ability to continue to make progress. Thank you very much uh, for considering our request and for the opportunity to testify today. Was that quick enough? Thank you, thank you, that was very brief. Thank you so much for your cooperation. Um, I'm actually only have one question. Um, FY16. Um, I guess that was pretty much, that was, okay, that was partially the term. So city and, and federal officials stated that the city of Philadelphia effectively ended homelessness among veterans. Correct. Is that something that we can still claim? Yes, we um, have, we are sustaining that effort. And just to be clear, what that means is that everyone who we can get in is in. Uh, but, for example, we're working with a veteran up in the Northeast right now who's actively using and is refusing services on a daily basis. But we're reaching out and we work with the Veterans Multi-Service Center and the VA in a coordinated fashion. And the minute he's ready to come in, there will be services and a place for him to live. So it's based on people that we've identified that are interested in, in coming in, so to speak. I mean, we know the challenge with homelessness because of some of the mental health and drug addiction issues that there's not even any um, interest whatsoever in these individuals coming into the system. Are we talking about those people? Or are we just talking about people that are willing to participate in our process? Because like, I, I find it hard to believe that there are actually no more homeless veterans? Well, there are certainly veterans who are homeless, but they are the ones who we have not yet been able to be successful in getting them to come in for a variety of reasons, maybe because of their mental illness, maybe because of trauma, maybe because of addiction, or all three. But that doesn't mean that we've given up on them. It, that's the effect of the trauma of combat is uh, changes the chemistry and structure of your brain. So what we do is continue to engage them over and over and over again, just like we do with everybody on the street through our outreach teams. And that's the best thing that we can do is to continue to give them hope and to maintain a human connection and to offer services. And um, I know behind me here are some folks who have experienced homelessness themselves. And what people tell us that that what makes a difference is that our outreach workers and our staff never give up. And we never know what's going to be the day when they're going to be willing to come in. What we do know is that when we're able to offer a real place to live, a house or an apartment, that that is also a game changer for people. Mm -hmm. Because especially with older folks, they don't want to live along to somebody else's rules. They want to be the master of their own castle, just like the rest of us. Yeah. So the more we're able to offer that housing at the end or at the beginning, the better our success rates are. All right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Chair Rick and Councilwoman Blackwell. Thank you very much. I appreciate all that you and your team does. Thank you. And we appreciate your support. Thank you. And... Um, I don't know why I haven't done it before, but 
You know Operation Stand Down? Yes, of course. So, um, in fact, we talked, we met about a week ago and still deal with them. Because yep. a lot of those are the same sorry, people. I don't know, I've been dealing with them at least a dozen years or more. And, yeah, it's uh, very effective. So, um, you know, we'll see if there's some way. I'll talk to Ed and see if there's something we can do for some of those. Because as you know, most of those are the same people too. Thank you. And we do, anytime a peer can be involved, that really is very powerful. Okay. Do we still have um, Blueprint? Sorry? The Blueprint? We do still have the Blueprint. Um, we've housed, uh, in partnership with the Housing Authority and the Department of Behavioral Health, about 3,500 people um, with an 88 to a 97 percent success rate in preventing a return to homelessness. At this time, um, we are behind in uh, singles vouchers by close to 300, and we're behind in family oppor housing opportunities, I think, by nearly 500. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to host a, an event with affordable housing providers who have gotten project-based Section 8 um, to try and invite them in to list some of those units through our supportive housing clearinghouse. Yeah, uh, Mr. President, I assume that while I was alive and working, that one day we'd, we'd have our hands firmly around all of this. So we'll see. I'm still trying. I'm still, you know... Uh, uh, some some days, you know, I, I can tell the difference from uh, 40 years ago, but not every day. But uh, thank you, and uh, I feel it. we always look yep. forward to working with you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, thank Council Lady. And I, only, I couldn't imagine what it would be like had you not been involved all of these years. If you thank take you. away all the work you've done and all the people you've served, we'd really be in trouble. Thank you. So I want to thank, thank you for the Thank you. Thank you. God is good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chair recognizes Councilwoman Kiona Sanchez. Thank you. Good afternoon. And I'm, I'm going to be brief. I, you know, the work that this department and this unit does and the work Councilwoman Blackwell does is absolutely, positively God's work. Uh, I want to publicly you. thank the team for all their work around Gurney Street. Um, you know, Liz has been at the table and, and her budget is not the biggest, but she's always been willing um, to come forward and, and do the best she, she can um, with a very complex situation. So I appreciate that. I just wanted to put on your radar, you know, we've been so busy with Gurney Street, we haven't had the opportunity to talk a, a little bit about the fact that um, under the Nutter administration, the only family-based uh, bilingual shelter that we had was closed. And at some point, I'd like to begin to, to discuss that. Uh, culturally, Latinos don't like to go into shelters. One of our challenges has always been um, families in, in particular. And, and so I think we should re look at that again and the geography. I know that um, uh, the women's, um, some of the groups have been looking at creating some opportunities in eastern North Philadelphia, but I think the great work that's been done um, in counting some of the homelessness in Philadelphia has really opened up our eyes mm -hmm. about where people are relocating as we move them out of Center City. They're not disappearing, they're going into neighborhoods. Um, and I think we need to start looking at that and figuring out how do we reestablish something like that in Eastern North Philadelphia. But thank you for all the work that you do. Thank you, and I would welcome that opportunity. Thank you, Councilwoman. Chair recognizes Councilman Green. Thank you, Council President. Um, I'm following up on questions asked by Councilman Sanchez and Councilman Blackwell. Um, and listen to your testimony when you made reference to shelter safety. I know from my experience of you know, working in the law department where I used to represent the Office of Highland Community Development and got to know some of the issues um, in this department, also when it was OESS, um, when it was under the leadership of Danette Mintz, who I see who's here in the audience, who's retired but not retired anymore again. Um, that's always been an issue about shelter safety, and from my experience talking with advocates in uh, this community, that's always been a concern of people not wanting to go into shelters because of their own personal safety and would much rather be on the street. Um, and you talked about shelter safety initiatives. Can you give some more detail about what you're doing to um, address some of the safety concerns in shelters? 
I can. Um, well, first of all, I want to say that being in our emergency housing is much, much safer than being on the street. Where are they? Um, but they still have that perception, so. I, um, I get uh, a copy of every single incident report of anything that happens that has safety manifestations in, the, in any of our programs, and the incidents are very few and far between, which doesn't mean that nothing bad ever happens, but they are few and far between. What we have been doing is um, extensive. Beginning last year, uh, we have done complete assessments of all the facilities that by Homeland Security, fire, LNI, and police to assess safety. And we have addressed um, all of the LNI concerns around safety, and all of our facilities now have wands. And those that will, um, would like them have security guards, they have the ability to lock the door. We have been providing the prepare training to both all of our, to all of our providers and staff, active shooter training, de-escalation training, mental health first aid, all of those kinds of training so that staff are skilled and equipped to deal with any kind of safety situation. Uh, we are uh, tomorrow actually uh, un unveiling new shelter standards that will get at not just the safety concerns that I've mentioned and you've addressed, but also how we can continue to reduce barriers to people coming in. For example, you know you do not need an ID to come into shelter, um, so, which is like one of the myths that's on the street. We don't charge shelter fees. We don't require people to save money. We encourage them to save money, but we don't quote unquote take their money. So we are systematically breaking down any of the barriers to coming in. And I think that really trying to build up some of these smaller programs, especially on the single side, uh, so that people don't have, there aren't as many obstacles for them to come in and that the outreach staff can bring them in, that this is true. At some point, I think we probably need to do some marketing. I'm working with the Mayor's Office of Policy. They have this um, human-centered design initiative with the University of Pennsylvania. And so our hope is that we will be one of the pilots chosen to actually talk to people about what their experience is of coming into our system, either from the street or th um, through intake, so that we can um, use the human-centered design to look at how we can make it friendlier, easier for people to come in off the streets. All right. One of the things that I was going to say in your outreach efforts, trying to get out that message that um, the shelters that people may have been thinking about before, the misconceptions, are actually changed and that you're taking steps to address the safety issues. You also talked about uh, respites. Yes. Um, one of the concerns has also been around for a number of years that there is not enough shelters. And so the respites, I'm assuming those are smaller facilities. Mm -hmm. uh, and those short-term facilities. And can you give me some perspective on that? We, we don't distinguish in length. We try. Our goal is for people to be able to move quickly out of any kind of um, emergency situation or to prevent them coming in in the first place. Um, my personal bias is that growing the shelter system is not the solution to homelessness that the solution is to expand prevention and diversion at the front door. We've actually engaged um, a national expert uh, in, with the help of the Family Services Provider Network to analyze who's coming into our shelters and where they're coming from and if we, what steps we could take to help them not enter emergency housing if they don't need to. So we believe that more prevention and diversion and then at the back end, more permanent housing are going to be more fruitful uses of dollars rather than building shelter. Uh, uh, just two more quick questions. Um, one of the things that Councilman Sanchez raised was in reference to um, um, bilingual um, facilities. And also, I know we're families. That's also been the issue that if you're uh, a family, uh, it's father, mother, and children, and going to shelter system, there's a challenge in keeping the family together. Um, what steps are being taken to provide more um, housing opportunities for families who may be homeless? And then the other last question is that um, there's also, um, some would say a perception of an increase in number of homeless people. Uh, I want to get your thought on that and also what is the current census of 
homeless people in the city of Philadelphia? Mm -hmm. Okay, those are all really good questions. Um, on the bilingual shelter, we do have programs that are sta that are bicultural and bilingual. For example, Congresso is one of our main providers of rapid rehousing. Prevention Point is also one of our providers of emergency housing, and there are bilingual outreach staff working throughout the city and particularly over in the Kensington area or east of Broad when there's higher concentrations. Um, so we are, that, those are some of the, just a few of the steps that we have taken. On the family side, we do have um, several shelters, I think three or four, that accommodate full families. Um, I, we do certainly, would certainly like to have more opportunities and really more on the prevention side. Uh, we are working closely with DHS to figure out how we can support families in their own homes and make sure that they don't end up in the homeless system except as an absolute last resort or conversely that they can be reunified when the courts deem that they can. As for the number on the, of people on the street, uh, we will be releasing our point in time count for 2017 in just a few weeks. Uh, we are equally concerned that the numbers have grown. Uh, we believe that the main reason for this is the opioid crisis. Uh, we're seeing um, a growth in the numbers of people who either have addictions and or uh, behavior, other kinds of mental serious mental illness or co-occurring disorders that um, Roland Lamb talked about. Um, and also the supply of housing on the other end is, continues to be a concern. Um, so we do, we do agree that the numbers have begun to creep up and we are uh, really thinking, we are looking at full court press over the coming year. Uh, we know that calls to outreach have increased by 50% over the past year. So we are, you know, these are all concerning trends. As for the census, um, again, our point in time count will be out shortly. We expect that the numbers of people um, experiencing homelessness who are in our system is going to hold steady about 62, between 61 and 6,200. Um, and that's, again, that's a point in time. That's not over the course of the year. And how does that compare to prior years? That, that number saying? is about the same. Uh, the, it's the number of people who are on the street that seems to have increased, it's, which is very disturbing and distressing and um, I think really needs to be addressed. And I think the other piece is uh, going back, uh, not to pass the buck, but 51% um, of our budget does come from state and federal sources. Um, and so the continued erosion of those resources does put a, even a greater burden on the city. And just one final question. And your dollars also not only to, um, but also do those dollars include a loss of prevention dollars for homelessness. Like to, uh, I know I've done work with um, John Rowe and Utility Emergency Services Fund and other organizations that try to prevent people well, try to enable people to stay in their homes. So when you say the loss of state dollars, are those dollars primarily on the prevention of homelessness that you may have lost, or a combination uh, of both? No, uh, right now we're talking about the, uh, the most recent is the homeless assistance program. We use those for shelter. For shelter. Uh, okay. We're actually, uh, you know, we're hoping that we're gonna be able to increase our prevention dollars next year mm -hmm. between the housing, the local housing trust fund mm -hmm and uh, what's called emergency solutions grant dollars and then the CSBG funds right. that come through CEO. Okay. Um, but really and truly what we need to be doing is increasing prevention and diversion at the front end and housing at the back end so we don't have such a clogged pipe in the middle. Okay. Thank you, Council President. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Councilman. Chair recognizes Councilman Don. Thank you, Council President, and good afternoon. Hi, Councilman. Um, can you give me an idea? I, th I think you told me it was like 808 is that the number for homeless people in the city right now? Is that inaccurate or accurate? Uh, as of the uh, 2016 point in time count, it was 705 unsheltered that we counted and uh, 6112 who were either in emergency or transitional housing or safe haven that we know of. 6,112. I believe that's correct. But 705 were unhoused. Unsheltered, homeless. yes. And I thought I heard you speak yesterday morning saying of the top cities in the country, we have some of the lowest levels of homeless people. You heard me correctly, yes. We have uh, the highest deep poverty rate of any city in the country, 
but we still have, thankfully, uh, oh my gosh, the lowest street homelessness rate of the largest cities. Isn't San Diego like close to 14,000? I don't know, but I know LA is like 26,000. Yeah. Yeah, it's a <clears throat> national epidemic. Right, right. Um, anyway, I, f I think you're, you and your department are doing a great job. Thank you, thank you for and, your support. And I would say that if you need more money to do more resources, I'd be supportive of it. Thank you very much. So. We have requested another million dollars. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Thank you, thank for you, you do. very much, Councilman. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. So, either you're doing a great job or we're just tired. So we have no other questions. <laughs> Maybe both are true. All right, all right. Thank you so much for your testimony. Thank today. you, Council all President. Right.